I'm Mark Hummel, and welcome to Mark Hummel's Harmonica Party. I have my friend Fido De La Parra from Can Heat today, and we're at his house in uh, in Southern California, and we're going to talk about Fido's story and the Can Heat story and, and, and the wild tales that uh, he wrote about in his book, Living the Blues, which is one of the funnest rock and roll books I ever read. Thank you. Thank and you. It's, I, I, it's I, I, really, I, I, uh, <laughs> it's an amazing testament to, you know, you keeping a band going for that, for that length of time. Yes, that's quite a, quite a, quite a journey that we have gone yeah. through. And um, you were born in, in Mexico City in 1946? Yes. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And your, wasn't your father, a, was he a diplomat, or what, what did he do again? No, my father was basically a businessman. A businessman. Yeah, okay. he was a businessman. But he was we pretty were, successful, right? He was successful, yeah. yeah. And uh, we were a middle-class family, like many American families, you uh -huh. know, growing in the big city, you know. And... My father was really into music and into American culture. He loved American culture and he loved jazz music. Mm -hmm. That's what was my, my, my first introduction to music was my dad taking me to all these movies at the time. Hmm. You know, the Glenn Miller story, the Benny right. Goodman story, right. the Gene Krupa story. Yeah. And one really old one that is not that famous, it was called Orchestra Wives. Hmm. And it's a very old film that it actually has the real original Glenn Miller band playing on it. Wow. And uh, it is a great, it's a, you know, those are the movies that my dad used to take me to when I was a kid, you know, eight, ten years old. Uh-huh. And uh, so that was my introduction to, to music for the first time. And you said the first album he gave you was the Little Richard album? The Little Richard. When Here is Little 13. Richard album when I was 13. That right. was my, my uh, birthday present, you know. And... Uh, I've heard that record over and over again. I got myself infected with all those grooves. Right, right. And, you know, and, and, and you know, that drummer, you know, uh, the whole thing was yeah. fantastic. I think it's Earl Palmer on Earl, Earl Palmer yeah. in most yeah. of them, yes. Right. Earl Palmer, you know, right. one of my idols, of course. Yeah. One of the greatest uh, rhythm and blues and, and rock and roll drummers. You Absolutely, know? man. You know, and... Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I set up my, I used to make my own drum kit with cookie boxes and mm -hmm. cardboard boxes. Right. I had no education. I didn't know exactly how to do it. And my symbol was one of those old fashioned 50s ashtrays they used to have from the 50s. Oh, really? They were huge and big. Yeah, right. And they had all these fluorescent colors, you know. Uh, and that's great. You, re you remember the campy, campy yeah, 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 stuff, yeah. you know, made of metal. Yeah, right. So I used to use one of those ashtrays as a symbol. That's great. And, you know, that's the way I started playing. So it how old were you when you started playing drums? Or, or... I, I was about 12. About 12? 12, 12, 11, around that. Uh-huh. Yeah. Actually, when I was a real, real little kid, maybe about four or five, they gave me a drum kit, too. Oh, really? My okay. grandmother did. But I guess I must have been making a lot of noise because I remember one day I woke up and the kit was gone. <laughs> and you know, I knew I was I was like four or five years old. It oh, didn't yeah, really yeah. matter so much, but that's one thing that I always remember. You know that I had this wonderful drum kit. Right. We were living in my grandparents' house. My grandfather was Austrian, and he was like, you know, very tight. And he, I, I guess, he didn't like uh, the noise. Right. He didn't right. like that noise that the five-year-old was making with that's his drums. Funny, I was yeah. having a ball. So your dad was a fan, but maybe not your not grandfather. Not my grandfather, no. Right. And this is my maternal grandfather, right. okay? Right. So, yeah, one day I wake up and the drums are gone. So I guess I went back to my cowboys and Indians and my soldiers. and. But eventually, <laughs> eventually you got hooked again by music. Oh, yeah, music. Yeah. Then, then, of course, later on, as, as, we, as I develop, I grew up. And as I said, in my teens and before my teens... My father took me to see those movies, and I got turned on by him. And then, of course, for the first time, and I got around 1959, 1960, Bill Haley and the Comets comes to Mexico right. City. Oh, wow. For the first time. Yeah. And uh, when you realize that the times were so different, I mean, this was a new music. Right. Coming from the north. Right. You know, coming from all these people that we already admire, that play right. jazz music and all that. Yeah. But rock and roll didn't exist. Right. You see? And this was thing, the first yeah. brand new thing. That, yeah. And there is Bill Haley and the Comets with the original band yeah. playing fantastic. I mean, they were they were playing almost acoustic. Yeah. 
They were really not that Did loud. they have that little guitar player? Oh, yeah, yeah, the original yeah, guy. The original guy, yeah, The yeah, blonde guy yeah, that plays those yeah. fantastic solos. Right. And, all, and they had Al Rappa on the bass and, and wow. Rudy Pompeo on the saxophone. Huh. And they had a couple of different drummers that I remember they did replace their drummers in, in Mexico. Uh, but it was quite a, you know, quite a shocking thing to see the first rock and roll band in, in history. You wow, know? Yeah, yeah. And uh, and being a kid, and of course, I, I got totally into it. Yeah. And I became a, a heavy duty fan of Bill Haley, of course. Yeah. Uh, Bill Haley eventually moved to Mexico. Did he really? Yeah. He married a Mexican girl. Wow. And he spent a long time there. He even recorded several LPs in Spanish. Wow. And I, I, I would no recommend idea. you to look for some of the Bill Haley stuff in Spanish because it's really funny. It's really well made. And, uh, that is wild. And he's got his, his American accent on that. Yeah. It's kind of cute. <laughs> but he's singing in Spanish with his band, with That's his original amazing. band. Wow. You know? So, yeah, but when uh, I guess Bill Haley was not quite as popular anymore in the U.S., and in Mexico, they just adore him. Yeah. And I guess he liked the vibe there, so more just relaxed figured, why and all not? that. Yeah. Yeah. And and he moved to Mexico and, and he played in, in normal theaters, you know, yeah. and shows and stuff all over. So we became very familiarized with him. Now, and how old were you when you were in your first band? I was, was early I, I signed my first recording contract at 13 years old. Wow. With CBS. Okay. So, so okay. there was a contest of bands, mm -hmm. teenager bands. We were all in our teens or earlier. I mean, I was, as I said, 13 years right. old. And the winners of the contest were the groups that are featuring this record. You know, Los Hooligans and the Sparks, which was my band. Right. Los Hooligans, which were quite popular later on. Now, didn't you join that band as well? Later on, yeah. yes. I played Los Hooligans and right. Los Sparks and all that. So this was really the first record I made, and this was from 1961. Wow. You see? Crazy. But I had my uh, my first uh, recording contract, as I said, uh, around that time, 1960 or 59, yeah. around that time. So then after that, we did this one which is also a Colombia record, right? Yeah, there it is, Colombia. Uh, and this is called Rock, Rock, Rock. Hmm. And there you see young little 13, 14-year-old Fido <laughs> right there. I didn't even have a uniform, so I had yeah. to wear a shirt. Now, was this the same group that went to Los Angeles? No, no, that was much later. Like, okay. this, this is Los Sparks. Right. And I'll keep going with this. You know, I play another band called Los Juniors. Okay. Which there I am again when I was wow. a young guy, you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, playing LPs, playing rock and roll and loving it in those times. And then I started getting more sophisticated and, uh, and joined a more sophisticated and better band called Los Sinners. Ah, okay. That's the band that came to the U.S. Okay, that's the one. Yeah, Los Sinners decided to come and try our luck in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, one, of our, one of the band members was American anyway, and he was a wonderful musician who shows a lot of things. He was an educated musician. He, I think he went to Berkeley and wow. learned saxophone, piano, all that. Right. And uh, so we decided to change our names and call ourselves Los Tequilas hmm. because we were coming to the U.S. and we wanted a more Mexican name right. for our, our, our identity, right? right? Not to have a half English name like Los Sinners. Right. Because one thing about all, all these Mexican bands, they have the Los right. in the beginning. Yeah. Los Locos del Ritmo, Los Hooligans, Los Sinners. Los it's Lobos. Los Lobos. I mean, there's Los, every, Los, yeah. Los Lonely right. Boys. Right. <laughs> you know right. I mean? Los Lonely Boys. There's always yeah. the Los That's it, right. before the name. Yeah. So, yeah, we decided to become Los Tequilas, and we came here to try our luck. And uh, we actually did pretty good. Now, how did you end up in L.A.? I mean, how did you get across the border and all that? Uh, we just went across. As tourists? The, uh, as tourists, yeah. We yeah. had, we had tourist, uh, tourist uh, papers. And, uh, right. It was amazing because uh, this friend of uh, Tony's father, Tony is the bass player, his father had a very close friend here in the U.S., his father used to fly in the Squadron 201, who was one of the squadrons that fought with the Americans against the Japanese. Oh, okay. When Mexico joined the Allies, yeah. you know, towards the end of the war. Right. And uh, 
And so they knew each other because Tony's father was in the Air Force, Mexican Air Force. Right. And this guy was a military guy. I'm doing an interview, darling. You have to leave <laughs> us alone. <laughs> That's just like my cat. <laughs> so, so, so this guy, this guy, the Air Force guy, loaned us a beautiful Chevy convertible. Wow. And we used to drive around in the Chevy, and, and that's how we crossed the border. Yeah. We were in this nice Chevy convertible. So they figured they must, our, they must be okay. We had all our, all our instruments there. Really? And you're, you know, this is 1965, man. Right, it was a right. much, much friendly situation, right. you know? And I remember crossing the border, and, and the guy even asked us, are you guys, you guys play mariachi music too? <laughs> you know? Right. That was what the Border Patrol guy asked us. Yeah. And we said, no, 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 we play rock and roll. We like, they never even checked us That's or amazing. And we went in and, and we started playing. We actually play at the Troubadour. We play at a place called the Lazy X, who many people don't know. It was a wonderful place from the, you have to remember the Los Angeles thing in, in the 60s. The music was just happening all yeah. over the place. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you were there, you were younger. No, I was, anyway. I mean, I was there, but I was 10 years old. Yeah, that's what so. I'm saying, you know, I was yeah, already, yeah. Uh, uh, the Sea Witch, you know, the, the Gasaris, the Whiskey right. Go Go. Yeah. I mean, all this other place, the Magic Mushroom. Right. I mean, all these places. And uh, so with, with Los Tequilas, we managed to play in some of these well-known places and be accepted. We even play in a private club called the Daisy, which is in Beverly Hills. And right, where I remember you saying that all these movie stars. All these would movies. Hire I mean, you. there I am from Mexico yeah. playing for Paul Newman and right. John Woodward right, and all right, of them. Right. They, they were there in the place. Yeah. Didn't uh, you say that they would hire you guys too? They'd hire yeah, you for they, private they, parties. they love us. They love us yeah. for the private party. That's right. why they took us to play right. in the den. Uh, the, yeah. So then later on, we had a, an Italian manager. Finally, we got a manager. Actually, before all this, I met Skip Taylor, who was to become Kent Heath's Ken manager. manager. Wow. We went to see him with my Mexican band. This is, Kent Heath didn't even exist, you know. Right, right. Uh, I went to see Skip Taylor, who was a young, preppy, well-cut, you know, well-cleaned-up man uh, in... in uh, William Morris agency, oh, okay. which is, you know, yeah, big heavy time, duty. Yeah. And uh, it is amazing that I met Skip Taylor there. And eventually, a few years later, he was going to become the Canned Heat manager. And right. he actually is the one that hired me, too. He, he came to see me play, you know, and did everything necessary for me to enter the band, you know. So let me ask you this. Before you joined Canned Heat, how long was Frank Cook in the band? Frank Cook, as far as I know, he, he must have been in the band about a year. About a year? Yeah. The band originally started in 1960, late 65 or early 66. Okay. So right around the time you were Yeah, here. I don't know yeah. exactly what happened there, but I know they had two other drummers before Frank Cook. Oh, okay. And they also had a couple of bass players. Huh. You know, uh, one of them, the guy that played with Spirit later. Oh, really? Yes. God, I forget his name right now. But anyway, uh, yes, so... They had a couple of bass players and a couple of drummers that I don't know really who they were. Uh, there are a couple, there are some uh, uh, website, uh, Facebook uh, pages on Ken Heath that right. tell the whole Get story. Into that. Yeah. yeah, if you want to know, you yeah. know, I don't consider that that important because it was a, a, a band that was in the process of being right. formed. Right. And basically, Bob Hyde and Alan Wilson were. The originators, pretty much. They were the band. originators, and they were experts musicologists. Absolutely. But they were not. They were not performers. Interesting. You see, they they didn't have any idea of, of performing on a stage. You but, know? but but Alan Wilson was already playing instruments. He played all over the place. He played trombone. He played the guitar. He right. was a, a, a harmonica, genius on the yeah. harmonica, right. and uh, his singing and all that. And uh, but he wasn't playing on stage. He was not playing on the stage. Oh, okay. You know, he maybe played a few, right. you know, coffee house type gigs. Interesting. Like that. But he, okay. They, so I guess that's what they decided to make a. a Job band, and was this the same with with Alan Wilson? I mean, with uh, uh, Bob Height and and uh, Henry Vestine being That's record later. collectors. Yeah, Henry came in later, and they and with, they knew with, they knew each other because Bob also worked at the Jazzman 
record store. Was Bob already collecting? He, he was oh, already yeah. collecting records. Oh, yeah. yeah. Bob started collecting when he was like five years old. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Okay. He told me that when he was five or six, he was always fascinated with the turntables and the records. Going Interesting. And was his brother collecting as well? It started later. Okay. His brother was like a, you know, a copy of, of Bob in a way. Right, right. And yeah. a, just a few years later, you know, yeah. Richard. Uh, so, as I was saying, they started with a jog band, yeah. which is basically what they wanted to do. They wanted right. to play acoustic, you know, with a jog and, right. the, and the Tina Corio, we call it in Mexico, the, uh, the, the, the jug, washed yeah, washed up bass. Washed yeah. up bass washed and up all bass. that, yeah. you know. Right. Which I used to play. I watched them oh, did you really? Uh, that was oh, a lot okay. of fun. <laughs> so anyway, that's how they started. And then I guess they decided that, you know, we, let's make it into a blues band. And yeah. then they started hiring different musicians that had previous experience on the stage. Because Bob and Alan just, yeah, you know, they were not performers. Green, yeah. They were, they yeah. were experts. They were yeah. musicologists. They were record right. collectors. Nerds, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Even if Bob looks like a badass yeah. uh, wrestler or something, well, the, the he jug, was really the a jug nerd. band thing was really a popular thing when you're talking about. Oh in, yeah. In the yeah. mid '60s, jug bands were like everywhere. A lot of people that like yeah. blues music, anyone that liked the blues history, had a jug band. The history yeah. of of this kind of music, you know, uh, the jug bands were happening. They and were. That's, yeah. And that's what Bob and I guess eventually came. He used to be a, a jug band. Right. I mean, so was Joe. Joe. Country Joe was... They also... Yeah, had a I, I recall band. that, too. Uh, I, I know the, about the it, too. Jim Queskin jug band. That's right. You know, so so that's... A, I believe Bob met Alan when John Fahey invited Alan to come to California. Mm -hmm. John Fahey was writing a book about Charlie Patton. Right. And all his stances and all his uh, very complicated music. Yeah. When you try to analyze Charlie Patton music, by the way, Charlie Patton is the father of all of us, okay? Absolutely. He's probably the first blues uh, performer recorded. I well, he know, was yeah. definitely before people like uh, uh, Robert Johnson and... Uh, yeah, a little son, before He was that. more of a the yes. Sun House generation. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And by the way, Charlie Patton's father was a Mexican. <laughs> was he? Yes. Wow. Yeah, that's why you see his face is not really right, 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 right. African American. Kind of, kind of a, a light skinned black guy. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. So I like this. He probably learned the guitar from his father. That could be. That's possible. Yeah. You know, it's possible. And I know that he was a huge influence on people like Alan Wolf. Oh, yeah. And, on, uh, on everybody. On, on all I mean, yeah. Sam Heath, and Robert you know, Johnson, all, yeah, all of, of course. them. Of yeah. course. So uh, we were talking about Charlie. Oh, yeah. So. John Fay, he was having trouble with this book about Charlie Patton. Uh -huh. And he needed somebody that really knew how to make the stanzas, that's how they call him, and how to write the music and oh, analyze okay. it and explain the 12, 13 and a half, uh, uh, instead of 12 bar blues, you know, 13 and a half, 14 right. bar, right. 15 bar blues. And all that. country blues, yeah. Exactly, the yeah. way the country guys used to play right. it. And uh, so that's, that's how Alan came to California. John Fahey invited him to come from Boston because he needed somebody that knew that much. But those two were already friends from what I understood. I don't know much about the past yeah. of John and Alan, but uh, they must have been already communicating with each other. Yeah, the, st the story I'd heard was that those guys were the ones, they were the ones that were kind of going and touring the South and looking for a lot of these guys. Yes, along yeah. with other guys, and Henry right. also included right. in that. Henry was sometimes. in that, and I think Dick Waterman. Dick was, Waterman, yeah, of course, was one, yeah. one of the ones, too, right. of course. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so I guess it was in those times that he rediscovered Skip James, right? Mm -hmm. And Son House. And Son House. Too. And I heard that <laughs> Alan Wilson was the one that had to reteach re Son, Son House, House how his to music. play those music. He was in a songs. hospital right. suffering from alcoholism, right. and he was very old and damaged. Right. So they had to sit Alan next to him yeah. and teach Son House how to play Son House again Yeah. so he could come to the Newport Jazz Festival. Now, did they find him in Rochester, do you know? Isn't that where you they know, found him? I don't, I know, the, I don't know the details. Yeah. But I, I know, so. I think he was, one of them was in Tunica, Mississippi, in a hospital. Yeah. 
I don't know if it was somehow I don't, yeah, I don't think it or, was or, uh, or the other guy. I, I, you know, I don't know Skip all the James, details. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah it could have been yeah. Skip James, too. Yeah. Well, Skip, you know, you, you, what a great talent, but also what a waste, you know, because of, he drank so much. And right. right. Killed himself, destroyed himself, yeah. like many others. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, that's the story about Alan. So in a way, I guess Alan must have visited the Jazzman record shop. Mm, oh, okay. And that's where he met Bob Hyde. Interesting. So they struck up a friendship. They struck up a friendship yeah. because they started talking blues talk and right, record sure. talk. Yeah. And it was never ending. I mean, those guys will talk about blues or about music. Yeah. You know, they, they will never stop because they right. knew so much. Was Henry kind of like that too? Henry was kind of that. A, l yeah. a little less than them. Yeah. But Henry's collection was fantastic too. That's what I heard. I heard him yeah. and him and Bob had the two biggest collections yeah, you in know, the world. Yeah, Bob's, Bob's was bigger than Henry's. Was it? Yeah. But Henry, you know, part of Henry's collection is still in, in South Carolina, I believe. Is it really? I, I had to talk to his son and see what happened to his, uh, especially his LP collection. Most of the 78s were sold already. Right. So basically, that's how the band got formed, and that's how they met Henry Vestine and the three of them. The Jug Band was already going, right. and the, the, can, the Canned Heath Band was already going, and that's when yeah. they joined Henry. Mark Andes, that's the name of the bass player. Oh, okay. Now, I'm not familiar with him. Mark Andes, yes. Huh. Yeah, okay. he, he played later with Spirit. Okay. And, uh, and th so that's how the whole thing started. And then they hired Frank Cook, and they recorded the first record, and they went to Monterey, the first Monterey Pop Festival, with Frank. Oh, so that wasn't you on that? I, I was not oh, okay. there. All right. it, that's in 66, yeah. I okay. believe. Yeah, that, yeah, it was 67, I think. Or 67, 67 early. 67, yeah. Because I came in in October of 67. Okay. See, a lot of things happened to the band then. That's when the band got busted in Denver. Okay, and for, that for is marijuana. a great story. Let me, let me pause this for one second, do second part. 